I'm Mayor Sean Cashman. I have the honor of opening up this session, which is the first of 11 consecutive sessions building on prior work. This session has an opening keynote, the first to report out from a professional workshop that was convened on a state of the state, or what I was calling the of Westphalia in the Banana region. You have a program in front of you which speaks to the intensity or density, to use your word, of what we've been aspiring to do. And uh, you also should have a, a publication of the new initiative for the Middle East Peace, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary as a constituent part of the Institute. And this particular volume is a volume that I'll uh, explain a little bit more when the Kurdish panel begins, but we can, we can begin to glance at it in the sense that it's our students' research from a few years ago in the Iraqi area of Kurdistan. We are a community, an intellectual community. This is Epic's 28th year, 29th symposium, and I'm extraordinarily proud of our students and our staff, all of our collaborators. And I would first like to bring forward um, Olivia to introduce herself. She's one of our teaching assistants for this year. She's been invaluable, a uh, Fletcher student, and you can say a bit about herself and start off with her students this year. Thank you. Um, and it is my distinct pleasure tonight to introduce our first panel of the evening, which is on the state of the state in the Middle East. And here to speak with us about it are Dr. Elie Levite, who's a non-resident senior associate <coughs> excuse me, in the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And Dr. Nimrod Hurwitz, who's a senior lecturer of Middle Eastern Studies at Ben Gurion University of the Nigeria. Thank you, good evening, and it's uh, a pleasure, a true pleasure to be here again in the midst of the wonderful students, faculty, and, and visitors from around the world who join us for EPIC. Uh, I've always become a regular here, um, but what I want to report to you is something extraordinary that we tried to do this year to complement the normal program of EPIC, which is actually to do a professional research workshop does significantly involve uh, a fairly uh, significant number of the students in a very intense research exercise to try and shed light as to what is really happening in the Middle East these days and try to particularly to understand if what we are seeing is a contagious process where the states of the Middle East either entirely collapse or at least significantly weaken across the region and if so, to ask ourselves, why is this happening? Why is it happening now? Is it happening? Is it absolutely unique to the Middle East? And where is it headed? And finally, can we do anything about it? So how did we approach this topic? Uh, leaving aside agonizing over the agenda for uh, uh, maybe a year, what was really um, uh, uh, clear to us was that the Middle East uh, constituted of a, a sort of fairly uh, significant diversity uh, of cases. And that it's quite likely that the circumstances prevailing in Egypt and, and the experience that Egypt had gone through in recent years is not synonymous with what had gone through in, in Tunisia, even if the uh, manifestation of the Arab Spring initially looked quite connected that what we're seeing in, in, the, um, in the Gulf may be uh, different than what we're seeing uh, in the core of the Middle East, notwithstanding the fact that we have seen a significant amount of domestic turmoil uh, in Bahrain, that we've seen it in, in Yemen, that we've seen, uh, uh, of course, uh, developments um, uh, of a different nature in Iraq. <coughs> so. The, the answer to the first question was we needed to look at a whole range of cases. And what we had done was we picked a, a four or five cases that we looked closely at uh, with the um, significant scholars from around the world and complemented the research with a handful of additional case studies 
which uh, the students here had done to complement our research. So we had a roughly 10 cases in front of us, each reflecting the uniqueness of that specific case. And we gave the scholars remarkably little guidelines other than trying to ask them the same questions I've already alluded to, why did it happen, uh, um, why did it happen now, <clears throat> what were the driving, main driving forces, and so on. So there was a common set of questions, but that was where the, the, the guidelines began and end. We then assigned several scholars to look across the cases. And the question that we posed to them was, if you actually looked at what was happening across the cases, from an economic point of view, from a social economic point of view, from the perspective of religion, from the perspective of youth empowerment, from the perspective of telecommunication technology, <clears throat> would you be able to find some common, either common phenomena, or at least some, some uh, common triggers that yield different phenomena related to the turmoil, current turmoil in the Middle East, in all of those cases. <clears throat> so there was a, this whole set of questions that, sort of, that cut, cut across. And I should add that uh, in order to do so, we have picked research sort of economists and, and, and uh, uh, political scientists and international relations experts and, and uh, uh, religious uh, studies uh, experts and so on and so forth. So we, we tried to, to do across the cases. There was also an intention which ultimately went unfulfilled lamentably because we had lost someone at the last moment to look at gender aspects and, and to what extent they played out in this broader equation. And then we decided that it would be appropriate to try and zoom out and ask ourselves is what we're seeing in the Middle East truly unique? Or maybe what we're seeing in the Middle East is a response to some global forces that are producing a certain result in the Middle East, uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless, that result may be only with somewhat more extreme than in other places. It uh, may be happening earlier than in other places. Uh, it may be somewhat more uh, profound in other places, but fundamentally, what we're seeing in the Middle East uh, is a response to global forces, be they economic forces, social forces, uh, um, the, the technological uh, um, developments and so on, which accounts for the phenomenon that we actually see. So in, in essence, to keep us kosher, we look at it globally. And finally, what we tried to do was to just ask ourselves, okay, suppose we have some understanding of what is happening and why it has come about, uh, and maybe partial answers of where it might be going. The question is, what can we and should we do something about? And as you can well imagine, for academics, it's the uh, question we, we feel almost morally compelled to confront, but also perhaps the least equipped, well equipped to answer. And uh, as you will hear from Nimrod, I think we've done a, a great job uh, on the analysis, but we have done uh, somewhat less uh, of, a, of a fine job in terms of the recommendations. Those require a hell of a lot more work. Let me just say one more thing by way of introduction before I turn over the microphone to, to Nimrod. The last question we asked ourselves was that we should not look just at failures, but also at successes. And we should not look only at countries where we should have gone through this change, but those who were left standing. And one of the particular questions that we were trying to come to grips with had to do with the monarchies in the Middle East. How come we had seen a lot of turmoil in the, in, the, um, in the other countries, but we haven't seen that occurring, at least not on an enduring nature, in the monarchies in the region? And I know that some of, the, some of you would immediately think, but those tend to be filthy rich, and so had a lot of money to throw at their population, but that doesn't hold true for Jordan, that doesn't hold true for Morocco. So obviously there is something different there, uh, and so on. So we looked at successes, and we looked at failures, and among the successes, the different definition of success, and some of them, you can define successes where change did not occur. Some would actually look at that as a failure of, of, the, of the, um, the movements for change. So those were all the questions. Let me turn over the microphone to, to Nimrod to describe uh, the, some of the answers that emerged. 
So as I said, we started out with a set of questions, and we ended with a set of questions and a few disagreements. And uh, that's what we expect from that kind of forum. Basically, the Arab Spring started out, as we all know, as a moment of optimism. And today, three years after, it's uh, more like a playing out as a tragedy. And we wanted, in this forum, to understand how the power play works. And so it's more like a snapshot and an attempt to understand this picture that we're looking at by looking at the histories of these uh, case studies that Ellie has mentioned. Um, the first thing that strikes anybody who looks at the uh, Arab Spring is the involvement of the people, of the masses, in the politics. This is an act which actually many scholars and uh, observers of the Middle East were very surprised to see because we have gotten used to see a certain level of passivity. And that was a mistake from our part, on our part, to expect only that. Uh, and therefore, most of the forces in the region, including, by the way, the security uh, apparatus in the states themselves, were surprised to see this uh, rise. So the involvement of the people in, in the uh, rebellions, till this day, actually, when we look at places like uh, Syria, um, is the first thing that changes. And that really means, at least in my opinion, and this is one of the disagreements, because Ellie and I don't necessarily see eye to eye on this, but that really means that something changed in the imagination, the political imagination of the masses in the Arab world. And it's still, we still have to wait and see to what extent uh, that plays out, and will it be there three or five years down the line. But for the time being, it's very clear that there is a new form of motivation among the people, and that, to, to our minds, was a very important um, change. Now, on the other hand, um, we see that in at least um, three out of five states, that's Libya, Syria, and Yemen, the regime was what we expected it to be. Cruel, oppressive. Uh, at this point now, what they can do, and I'm talking mainly about Syria, and to some extent uh, Yemen, um, they can use cruelty to oppress the people, to subdue the, the, the revolt. They are incapable today of giving any service. They are incapable today, all five states that have undergone the Arab Spring, of really running an efficient economy. Um, and so this is the sort of the, the, the flip side. On the one hand, the people get involved. On the other hand, they have really deteriorated their lives. So when we were all talking about the Arab Spring in the beginning, we were expecting to be some kind of improvement here. For the time being, at least, we're talking about regression straight through whether they succeeded politically, whether or not they economically they have uh, received. Now, as Ali said, uh, one of the most interesting things when you look at the whole of the Middle East, is the monarchies. What happened in the monarchies that keeps them standing while other nations have, uh, the, the regimes, the, the leaders have fallen, uh, is, a, is a fascinating uh, question. Um, and I think the way to approach that is through various sociological and economic uh, analyses that we did not go into but are really necessary. You have to understand the patronage system in these uh, states. And once you look at that, you begin to understand, to see uh, how the power trickles down from the top bottom and why it remains as it uh, remains. Um, and then, of course, there's the good news in this whole story, the one potentially good uh, story, and that is Tunisia. That is the exception here. And Tunisia, because of this, is such an exception, is so interesting. Because what we see is that Tunisia has a history in which the opposition movements, be it the Islamists or the secularists, have had a long dialogue for over a decade, long before the Arab Spring started. And that this rapprochement between the two, uh, I would say, cultural and religious uh, trends, is what enabled them to talk to each other once the Arab Spring took off. So, when the leader uh, left Tunisia and when the vacuum of power opened 
and they had to reach some kind of agreement about how they're going to run the state. And the critical moment in this matter is when you formulate the constitution, because that is where you decide what are going to be the rules of the game for the next generation, two or three. And as you can see that that was where most of the tension was between the various trends. That was also where Egypt failed was the moment where they had to define the rules of the game, the rules of the political game and the constitution. This is where Tunisia rose and the, the leaders in Tunisia were able to rise to the occasion and actually compromise. And that is the key. When you formulate a constitution, you must compromise. And the leaders in Tunisia did so. And that is why they came out of all of this intact and capable today of solving their political solutions and hopefully they'll be able to proceed and actually address their economic issues. And if that will happen, we'll know that two, three, four years down the line. If that were to happen, then we can say that Tunisia actually went through this transformation, through, started in the Arab Spring and then the eight, nine years later as a success story. One other very interesting um, player in this game is the religious movements. So what we have is, for the most part, the religious movements play a very, um, I would say, aggressive uh, role that threatens the state because uh, the sunni shiite divide, which is basically the sectarian strife of these uh, states, be it Syria, be it Lebanon, which didn't go through the Arab Spring, but it's still there, Iraq, which also didn't go to the Arab Spring, but still you can see the, 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 the tension. In all of these countries, you've got a situation where two versions of Islam, two movements, conflict with each other, and they're tearing the state apart. So in that sense, religion is playing a very negative role. It's also playing a negative role through Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda does not believe in the state system. Al-Qaeda does not believe that there is legitimacy to states, and it doesn't matter if it's Western states or Muslim states or any other kind of state. What Al-Qaeda wants is a caliphate, in other words, one unit, one political unit that's run in accordance to the Sharia, their interpretation of the Sharia, which is very unique and extreme, and therefore they also constitute a negative factor when you look at the states. Um, the, the positive side here, in terms of religious uh, movements, are the religious, nationalist religious movements, such as the Muslim Brotherhood, and Nada, and others, that want to play the political game. These states contribute, uh, these movements contribute quite a lot. These movements are willing to recognize democracy. They're willing to accept a, a Western political concept and play the game in accordance to this concept. And we saw them succeed in Tunisia. We saw them succeed in Egypt. They displayed their hands, and I'm not going to go into what happened in Egypt, but obviously they won the elections. They lost, after a year, they lost their control. And so as a result of that, the Egyptian story is not so positive. But still, we have to understand that the nationalist religious movements are play a positive role, as opposed to Al-Qaeda and the Sunni Shi strike. And I'll just end by talking about the uh, policy session that we had. The bottom line of all of our discussion during that day was that we are talking about a very complicated situation. It's very, it's changing at a very fast pace. It's very fluid. It's really mission impossible in terms of policy making to come up today with uh, a certain clear uh, policy that the United States or any other country, Europe, or any other country in the world uh, should implement. And therefore, it was very interesting to see that the people who were talking about policy more or less uh, raised up their hands and said, frankly, we don't know. Thank you. Three countries out of five. I don't know if Bahrain comes 
one of these five countries. And you, s you also split the countries to monarchies and uh, other countries. Uh, if you exclude Bahrain, then you can uh, uh, justify this division, monarchies and uh, republics. Uh, but if you include Bahrain, um, difficult to put this, um, this divisions. Also, I don't know if uh, other countries which are uh, republics which did not be part, which wasn't part of the Arab Spring, such as Sudan or Algeria or many other countries. So, why we have such kind of uh, uh, focus on the monarchies uh, as they had a special case? Thank you. Well, the only, the, there wasn't such a, an emphasis on the monarchies other than to say that with one of the questions we're trying to come to grips with is how come the monarchies seem to fare the, 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 um, the challenge uh, better, better not in a, in, in a moral sense, but better in the sense that the regime has largely left, been left standing. That was the intellectual question we were asking, not the moral question, but the intellectual question. And I think Nimrod had already alluded to part of the answer that began to emerge. And it seemed to have been that the monarchies were more astute in terms of the instruments they were using of patronage to remain in power, even if the resources available to them were rather limited, as was the case, for example, in Jordan. So we, that was the only reason we looked at that. We looked a little bit at Warren, and thankfully we had um, um, Samir Faraj here would uh, uh, discuss uh, uh, discuss with us uh, Bahrain, but Bahrain wasn't the main focus of of, um, of our interests. So that's essentially, I think, to address your question. Yes, question. Yeah. Uh, do you believe that uh, the economic states of the countries of MENA created a common result, or do you think they were all individualized? Were they all individualized? Yes. I think that the, the economic analysis has basically suggested that they, they, they have enormous amount in common. Namely, that they're all way, way behind the rest of the world in terms of their economic performance on key variables. And that the situation, in fact, has been getting worse rather than better over time. So both in comparison to the developed world, as well as in comparison to the developing world, their key performance on all key attributes that are necessary to development, ranging from economy to business environment, in all of those categories, the, the countries that we're talking about are not only manifesting uh, um, some very alarming signs now, but in the absence of a radical reform, are likely to do even worse in the future. And in fact, one of the vexing questions we were trying to come to grips with are, is there anything that one can do to um, encourage a change in a direction, given that such a change would be very time consuming? And some of the population isn't particularly patient, not to mention the, the public misery, while you're going through it. So what Ellie did is speak about the future, but in fact, when you look at the past, or the present, there is, of course, uh, there we can see variations. Um, the states that have um, oil are capable of maintaining their population at a much higher level the level of personal misery is usually much lower economically, and therefore the, the incentive to go out and to uh, rebel is very different. That doesn't mean things didn't happen, things were happened, and, and there was uh, a lot of uh, disgruntlement in, in, in Saudi Arabia and other countries. It, it began, but it was very, very quickly put down. And in those countries, it was put down through money. In other states, it was put down in, in other ways. So when you want to understand the dynamic that led to the uh, specific uh, behavior of states in the Arab Spring, the economic situation is different, and it does create some kind of differentiation. Thank you. 
expression of this? Sam Whitefield, member of the 2014 <coughs> Epic Colloquium. Uh, I wonder, I've heard multiple answers to this question from different people. So in the expert opinions uh, that your group reached, how large of a factor does tribalism play in Libya specifically, which I noted existed as one of the states that is currently failing, not capable of uh, carrying out the functions of the state? Tribalism today in Libya plays a, a very important uh, role. Um, this is the basic division into which uh, the Libyan society has uh, fallen into. In other words, what you see is this. Once the rebellion is over, there is a vacuum of power. And when you want to look at who's moving into this vacuum, um, in Certain countries, such as Syria, for instance, it would be religious movements that are moving in and trying to fight and, and take control of pieces of land and so on. And Libya stands out because of the importance of the tribes in this uh, dynamic and the way that they are uh, dividing society, the way that they uh, raise militias uh, and so on. So in Libya, the tribal question is perhaps the most uh, important in terms of understanding the present situation. It is not necessarily the force that led to the uh, uh, rebellion and so on, but it has become one uh, once it started. Okay, so uh, I think we have to move on to the next speaker. Uh, so thank you for the wonderful panelists.